Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today's guest is a retired Ranger and Green Beret in the U.S. Army. He spent the last 25 years working in special operations, and now he travels the world training law enforcement and military groups. Please welcome Jack Nevels. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Caleb. Appreciate it. Hey, no problem. I'm glad you're able to make some time to talk to me because you have a unique background and you know, most of our guests are martial arts centric that do other things, but you're a little bit on the other side. We're a little bit more military operation centric that does martial arts as part of the training program. So right. we're going to kind of go through that. A um, little bit of your background, join the military at a young age. Do you feel like that was something you always knew you wanted to do or was that something that you grew into? You know, I, I kind of always knew growing up it's something I wanted to do. Um, it, it's kind of weird. Uh, I was adopted, but my parents had adopted me. My dad, who adopted me, was in the 82nd Airborne uh, way back in the 50s. And then uh, my parents, unfortunately, split up. But then I got a new dad, my stepdad, and he was actually an infantry officer. So it just all kind of worked out that way. And my mom always joked, she goes, I can't ever remember you not having a rifle and some piece of camouflage on. And, you know, it's kind of weird. Ever since I was a little kid, it was always something... I was just always intrigued with. It was like something that was in me that just said, you know, that that's kind of what you need to do. So I was really fortunate to have one of those lives where um, there was this specific track that I could take that was designed specifically for somebody who had the desire to do what I want to do. And that was in the special operations community. And it ended up being a great career and um, a great time. And I got to work with the best people in the world. So I got no complaints. Yes. Well, whenever you got into the military, was it kind of what you expected? Did you fit in well or was there an adjustment period? Yeah, you know, it's kind of the, you don't know what you don't know, you know, and I'd heard stories from my dad and um, I had, my brother was also, also in the military. And so he kind of told me stories and, you know, you have these, you get to see war movies and you see MASH growing up and you, so you have this image in your head of what you think things are going to be like. And normally it's not like that. Um, Things started out kind of slow, you know, it's like when you're young and all hard charging and motivated, you're like, yeah, I just want to jump into this and, and get after it. But, you know, there's that maturity process and that training process you have to go through. To, and, you know, it was good because you end up going through, you know, from airborne to ranger to special forces. And there's all these filters that you go through. Then you end up with a an amazing group of people that you end up with because they've all kind of gone through these filters. So the guy that you end up with at the end is a, is a great bunch of people. And again, the guys I got to work with um, throughout my career, I, you just couldn't ask for, for better men who would, you know, literally lay down their life for you and I would for them. So it was, it was a real honor to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, when you were going through in, in the military, there's a lot of training and, and, you know, and you have a martial arts background. Did that martial arts background start in the military from the training or was there a little bit that was when you were a kid, you know, if you did some martial arts karate or something like that? Well, you know, I, I didn't do any martial arts as a kid. However, in high school, I started wrestling and where I went to high school, we didn't have a middle school. It was first through seventh was elementary and eighth through 12th was high school. So I was 12 years old in eighth grade because I started school a year early when I was a kid. And um, so really from about the time I was 12, I started wrestling, which is kind of, you know, as you see from MMA, a lot of these guys start out. So a lot of those, you know, core things that you have of body position and proprioception and balance and timing and just your ability to work hard and be able to think under pressure and think while you're being beat on you know, those things were in there. And that's something I really enjoyed doing as a kid. It was kind of like the only thing you could, um, you could do legally without getting suspended from school. It was the only type of fighting you could do. <laughs> I did enough of that too. I was, I was probably a bad kid, but uh, not a bad kid. Maybe just misunderstood. Anyway, <laughs> so it, yeah. it is what it is. But um, so I did that all the way through high school and I really enjoyed that. And I think that kind of set me up for, uh, for success there. It was interesting in high school, I got involved with an explorer group, which is kind of an offshoot of the Boy Scouts. And in this explorer group, it was a military science group. And the guy that ran it was a Green Beret in Vietnam. And I had the utmost respect for him. And so that was about 10th grade. And so right from there, I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. And so from that point on, you know, I, I remember reading in National Geographic magazine that, you know, commandos didn't wear underwear because, you know, you get jungle rot in the jungle. So 
I just immediately stopped, you know, and, and my, and my, my dad comes to me one time and goes like, Hey, your mom said that, uh, she hasn't seen any underwear in the dirty clothes. I was like, yeah, dude, I'm like, I'm going to be a commando. I don't do that. I'm like, that's, that's oh, like girl stuff. So anyways, it was just kind of, you know, I was all in. <laughs> so yeah. it was kind of one of those stupid kid things, I suppose. But, you know, it just, well, I mean, you that's how my life just kind of cracked. Yeah, you, you hear a lot of similar stories. It's kind of like the kids that were buying ninja masks and throwing stars as a teenager because they were going to be a ninja. Yeah, they're going to be and, a ninja. And, Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, it's a very similar thing. And so when you got into the military and you moved into special forces or special operations, when you started becoming an, a, you know, active with that role, like you got through the training and you're out doing missions, things of that nature, were you training other people at that time or was it all about just execution of you're just being told where to go and what to do? Well, you know, I started out in the Ranger battalions um, and the Rangers are kind of a unilateral strike force, meaning that they work generally independently. It's just, you have a group of Rangers, we were doing airfield seizure. This is pre-Panama, just to date myself a little bit. So that's kind of our focus. That's what we did. And then at the time when I went in the military, you couldn't go straight into special forces. They have the 18 x-ray program now where we can take guys, have, you know, if their, their scores and whatnot are high enough, we'll take them off the street. And that's about a two year pipeline from, you know, entering basic training to putting your green beret on your head. It's a very long, arduous course. Um, but uh, I've helped a couple of kids in my neighborhood who I thought would fit that, you know, get in and, you know, they're off doing great things for the country now. But when I was in, you had to be an E4 promotable or a specialist, you know, getting ready to be sergeant before you could go to selection. So I spent a couple of years in the military before I went to selection. And during that time, I was able to go to airborne school and ranger school and, these, and this. And But um, it wasn't until I got to special forces where we really started to you know, one of our missions is foreign internal defense, and that's where we'd go to other countries, and then we train um, other, both police and military organizations to help them better solve their own internal problems. And so that's right. kind of when I started, really started yeah. to train with partner nation forces. And, and that was one thing, like, because when you get to that level within the military, you basically get access to very high-level resources. So you got to start training with a lot of high-level performers, both, you know, in the martial arts or in the firearms community and things of that nature. Was there a few people that you trained with kind of in the martial arts, hand-to-hand -hand combat scenarios that really influenced you or impacted you to maybe, like, start adjusting your approach or to expand your perspective on that? You know, that's a really great question. Yes, there was. There, there was a couple that, that specifically come to mind. I trained with Ron Don Vito. He used to do the, um, the line system for the Marine Corps. And then when he retired, he, he came into the, started training special operations. And so his dojo was just right down the street. So when I was working at our hostage rescue school at Fort Bragg, um, if I wasn't on the range shooting, I would go over to his dojo and train. And I asked him one day, I said, hey, Ron, you know, why don't you ever teach me your line system that you do? And he's like, he goes, well, you're here four hours a day. I can teach you something better. He goes, that's for training where you've got two instructors that have to train 200 guys. And it's very rote, very mechanical to do that. He goes, but for you, he goes, because you have a wrestling background and you've already kind of had this timing, we can work on other skills. And so I was like, okay, great. And that's kind of where I got introduced to, um, he had worked with Colonel Grossman back when he was in the, in the core on some of the, on, when the book On Killing came out. And so I kind of got introduced to the, to the sheepdog thing. And I had my own thoughts on that, maybe for another discussion. And then while I was training there, I also got to train with Tony Blower and he does the spear system. You know, and I really, I really, really liked Tony's stuff because it was very intuitive and startled flinch reflex and a lot of this kind of things. And it just kind of resonated with me because it was all about, you know, train like you fight. Well, how do you fight? Well, you reverse engineer a real fight and then you, and so I ended up being able to apply a lot of those same principles that he used with um, uh, um, empty hands type training and apply it to weapons training. And then after spending a bunch of time in combat, it really kind of resonated with me because what I found was people would, there are certain things you can't untrain. It's kind of like if somebody hurls the baseball at your head, you don't jump into the karate kid stance. You just immediately throw your arms up and try to block your head from getting smashed in the face. And I found that in a gunfight, it was, it was kind of the same way. There were certain things like you couldn't get people to go, oh, you're going to do the slow 
hold up, walk in the room when people are shooting at you. I never once saw anybody do that while being shot at because your inborn survival mechanism goes, hey, you need to move fast and you need to shoot fast and you need to get off the X. And so it kind of helped with that reverse engineering process. And so, but a lot of the same principles applied. So, um, yeah. you know, that, that whole adage that a warrior has no preference to range. And I found that to be true, whether it's punching, clinch, kick, if it's, there's those ranges when you're empty hands, but then there's pistol range, carbine range, sniper range, shoot mortars range, drop a bomb range. There's all of these different ranges. And then every one of your fights is different. It's like, you know, when you go into the cage, you kind of study who you're fighting. And I found that it was real important for us to be able to evolve our tactics. Cause what we did in 03 and 04 was a far cry different than what I did my last trip in Iraq in uh, 2010. Very, yeah. very, you know, night and day our tactics were because bad guys evolved. They went to school. They're not dumb as, as well as we did. So, you know, I think um, having that flexibility in your mind and not get so technique focused, but be more focused on the thinking aspects of it to me were, were yeah. really, really important. And, and both of those guys did a, did a lot for me in that respect. So, you know, hats yeah. off to them. You know, it's all about maybe not what, what you do as a fighter, but you're more proud of what you see your, your guys do. It's almost like they gave you a principal infrastructure that just kind of added on to what you were already learning and studying to where you could apply it to different ranges of combat, like you said, or, you know, and apply it to the military training at, at what stage after, I mean, cause you know, we, we've talked previously and, you know, been friends, but people don't know. Um, so as far as like the number of combat missions, the number of years active, how long was it before they were coming to you to be designing and running a lot of the training within the military groups? Well, you know, I was very fortunate, just right time, right place. Um, I, I never approached my career of going, oh, I've got to get, I've got to do this job and do this job so I can move up. I just kind of did what I wanted to do and it worked out for me. Um, after about four or five years in combat, I came back to Fort Bragg. I was stationed at Fort Bragg, but I came back and then my, um, my second tour at the Special Warfare Center came up and I was an E8 at the time or a Master Sergeant. And that's the position where um, you're the NCOIC or the non-commissioned officer in charge, kind of like the project manager in, in civilian terms for some of these different courses. And that's where I got to run our, our urban warfare or our hostage rescue school and then later our sniper school also. And, you know, as I looked at it, it was just, it got back to that same adage, you know, train like you fight. And then I was, after spending, you know, years over there going on operations every single night, sometimes multiple operations, you know, I kind of looked at the way some of the things we did in training, we trained them because that's the way we'd always done it. And we did them because they were easy to grade and easy to quantify. You know, and so that's what made it important. Well, I can, I can test that with a pro timer. And I found that there, there are no magic techniques. Um, a good friend of mine was a, um, was a Delta operator um, in, um, in Somalia. And he said to me one time, he says, you know, he goes, for any technique you create, a scenario can be created that will defeat it. And that kind of resonated with me because I was like, you know, you're right. You know, well, I like to zig or I like to zag or I like to do this or I like to do a high low or I like to, you know, blah, 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 whatever. You know, and really what it comes down to, it's that, um, that old adage, you know, there, there really is no um, technique. You know, the great path is really no path. And it's like you have these skills, but the most important thing you can do in any fight, probably the same thing in cage fighting, is your ability to think under pressure. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Hicks and Gracie, um, I guess it's several months ago, maybe about a year ago now. Um, through Johnny Smith, you know, who I work with at SSGT. He and Johnny are good friends. And, you know, so I was out in California working on a, on a Hollywood project or some shenanigans out there. And um, I had a couple of down days. And he's like, hey, well, let me call Hickson and see if he can link up. So anyways, all that to say, you know, talking to Hickson, he, he says, you know, he thinks that everybody should learn jujitsu because it teaches you in life to be able to think under pressure and problem solve under duress. It, and, you know, I thought, man, that is such good wisdom, no matter what you do in life, whether it's business, whether it's martial arts, whether you're a soldier, whether you're a police officer, 
your ability to be able to think under, under stress and be able to think clearly is really, really important. And I found um, particularly in combat that one of the things that um, prevented people from being able to think clearly under stress was fear. And your ability to be able to kind of vanquish fear, you know, there's that Bible verse, you know, I haven't given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I really think that the opposite of fear is power, love, and a sound mind. You know, it's the power to be able to do what needs to be done. It's the love that you'll lay down your life for your friend. And it's the sound mind that really allows you to be able to think through a problem and be able to be able to take your skills and apply them in a new way. You know, like Einstein said, you know, uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. You know, essentially, your the knowledge you have is just plagiarism that somebody else learned. But if you have the imagination to apply it in a new way, well, that's truly, I, I think, what you're after. So I think, you know, in our community, it, it really fostered that type of thinking where we look for people who were kind of out of the box thinkers, you know, hear people say that all the time, oh, you know, we're out of the box, we're out of this, but a lot of times where the rubber meets the road, it takes a lot of uh, initiative and you kind of have to put yourself out there on a limb to do something that's the path less taken or it's something new because you're opening yourself up for criticism, for failure, for all these things. But, um, you know, but I found that's, that's kind of what you have to do. The world is evolving. Um, yeah. It's kind of, you know, we see that today with, what's going on with the, uh, with the police and everything else, you know, we all work in a different world now. For instance, everybody on the planet now carries a video camera with them. That yeah. has changed and everybody can communicate immediately. You know, you look at like the, the, the incident in Atlanta, they have eight cameras videoing one incident. I mean, think about that 50 years ago, yeah, it didn't even, wasn't even a possibility with what technology wasn't even a possibility. Does. So, you know, when you look at our tactics, our techniques, and our procedures, those are just really starting points for thinking. But I think that, um, you know, as technology evolves, we have to evolve with it. And a lot of times I found that organizations, whether it's police or military, they're very quick to adapt uh, new technology. Like if you want, hey, there's a faster car, you go, oh, that's great. Well, hey, if I give you this night vision goggle, you can see people at night. You go, oh, wow, that's awesome. And you'll adapt this new technology, but as soon as it gets into new training, they go, oh, well, now wait a second. Yeah. Because it's a little more subjective. But yeah. I think that's kind of the direction, you know, we all need to go. And, you know, my heart's out to police officers because they really do have to be the, mar the, the marriage counselor. You know, they have to be the, the social worker. And then they also have to be the guy that shows up at an active shooting. And then they also have to be the paramedic when they get to the car wreck with the people flipped over. So, I mean, they, ha they have so many hats to wear. It's, um, you know, my hat's off to them. That's a very, very um, tough environment. And, you know, from, we've done, got to do a little bit of training together. You know that so many of the good people that we've worked with, I mean, they're just great Americans who lay it all down for their communities and, you know, of course there's bad apples out there, like in any organization. Why? Because it's people, you know? Yeah. So, um, I hate to see the actions of a few cause, you know, kind of this group mentality of, you know, we're all bad or, or yeah. whatever. But, um, I mean, there's, well, and, well, but like you were talking about evolution and like technology influencing that it's like, you know, from a serious note of like, you know, the incidents where there's multiple cameras when there's a police or a law enforcement, you know, issue. I, I was talking to uh, one of my friends a while back about when he would go and fight, you know, Ensign Inouye is one of the greatest fighters, you know, in history. And he was talking like in those days, like you didn't know what to expect because there wasn't the technology of like filming fights or, you know, people posting stuff of their training. Sure. So there's so many unknowns. So you would show up for a fight and know very little. And, you know, and even as the evaluation of evaluating your performance would be like a crappy VHS tape, you know, with all the fuzzies sure. and stuff, trying to right. see what your habits are or how you handled certain scenarios. And then, you know, you fast forward it and you apply just like you're talking about with the law enforcement piece with mm -hmm. all this new technology. I mean, we're getting to evaluate strategies, procedures, and training methodologies on a level that has just never existed before. So there's some transparency, you know, but with Absolutely. transparency 
comes increased accountability. And there's usually an intersection of where the accountability is kind of outrunning the adjustment curve of like, we need to change the way we're training, change the approach to certain things. Because like you said, you're dealing with people and there's an education curve, there's a procedural curve and, and not everybody has the final answer. I mean, cause it's just like, Holding people down is very difficult, as you see in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, MMA, and you know law enforcement situations, which you're trying to hold somebody down. And when you kind of get into those circumstances, it's it's difficult to adjust. But in the end, growth comes from it. As long as you have people that are that are willing to seek knowledge, to seek improvement, Absolutely. it's just that the the curve of waiting for the adjustment a lot of times is that's the difficult part because you have tons of people that need to learn new skills and, you know, being in the martial arts and being in the grappling, just like yourself, you know, you wrestled most of your life. You've been training right. doing special forces and you've been afforded many opportunities to train with a lot of talented martial artists. You get to be on the ground more or be in altercations more. And you know how many thousands of hours it takes to train those sensitivities and to, and to retrain some bad habits that we just innately have. So when you look at, all of the military training from a very structured environment, all of your martial arts influences, what principles do you feel kind of transcend those two things? It's like, where do they meet in the middle outside of, you know, the Hickson perspective of, you know, operating under pressure? If you were going to add on a few more things that cross over, what would they be? Wow, that's a good question. You know, you, you go into the fight with the training you have you don't get to choose it and you have to be able to be have skills at all ranges. So I would tell people don't, you know, don't use your favorite move, use the one that's the worst for the guy you're fighting. And so I think you really have to not just do the things you like to do. You probably need to focus on the things you don't like to do and you need to be very well-rounded. Like for instance, um, when I started working with the police, I was, kind of shocked that they had defensive tactics people and then they had firearms people. Cause I thought, well, how does that work out? You, you don't get to choose which one of those you get, you get to do kind of like, you know, this deal in Atlanta, you had two guys that were wrestling a lot, wrestling with one guy who was intoxicated. And then because it, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but, it didn't appear that they had the skills that they needed in the defensive tactics world, but their only tool is a hammer. So then their problem looked like a nail and you ended up, you know, but all that, if they were to just, I mean, you got two guys wrestling with one dude, but it comes down to skill. So there, there is no substitute for that. I would tell people to make sure that you train at all ranges, be well-rounded yeah. if you will. And, um, you know, work on your deficiencies, be, be humble enough to go, you know what, I kind of suck at this, I really need to spend some time and invest in that. And I would tell people, keep yourself in good shape. Yeah. Um, the other part of being able to think clearly is your brain has to be able to get oxygen to do that. If you're so winded and so smoked, and then you pile fear up on top of that, you know, you're a vegetable at that point. You're, I mean, yeah. you're acting, truly, you're going to act like a caveman at that point. And then... One thing that I see miss quite a bit, especially in place training, is stress inoculation. Um, and that's a hard thing to do. I'm not sure what the what the fix is for for the um, for the law enforcement community, but like in the military, I used to take my guys to the dojo and we would fight. We would put gloves on and we would fight. Yeah. And I found that the guys that like to fight are the guys that like to fight. You know, whether it was with their hands, whether it was a rifle, whether it was this, whether it was that. And then I also found that people who could fight really well, it was much easier for them to be compassionate. Because mm. they had somewhere to go. They could be in a stressful situation and go, oh, well, I can handle this because ultimately I know if this thing goes totally look crap on me, I'm going to win and I'm going to prevail. Therefore, I can take the time to be a little more methodical on my approach with a person because I don't have to worry about losing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think a lot of that, you know, that mindset is there. And um, the other thing I would say is don't let, be real careful about letting things in sport influence what you do um, in the real world. 
and that gets back to like when I, out at our CT school, you know, when, when I went through as a student way back when, and then um, so many of the things we did look like three gun shooting. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Those guys are amazing shooters, but it doesn't take into account of someone else is trying to kill you back and your inborn survival mechanism going, oh, I'm just not going to jump out here and take this thing dynamic and do this and that. You're going to try to, you know, you're just going to see the eyeball and the, and the gun come around the corner instead of just, oh, let me jump out there and, you know, just John Wayne it. Eh, not so much. You know, it's a little bit different. So, you know, you got to you gotta train smart and always be the student. You know, never, ever, you know, every time I train, like I still go, like I'll be training with military guys in a couple of weeks and I've got, um, uh, of course, with some law enforcement guys coming up. And But whenever I train with law enforcement and I have for the last four or five years, I learn something every time I work with them. You know, and I've been in the business for a while, but sometimes it'll just be that one little thing. I'll be like, man, why didn't I ever think of that? That's brilliant. Or as technology evolves, they go, oh, well, this is what we do. And I'm like, I didn't know that. You know, so I always like to keep an open mind and never come across as that guy that knows everything because there, there isn't that guy. You know, right. you should have the humility to be able to always be a student and, um, you know, use what works. It's all about... It's all about the thinking. One of the things I always tell guys when I'm training is like, listen, I've yet to meet the person that can outrun a bullet. You know, Superman's a really cool dude, but I haven't met a, whole, a lot of those. The key is, is to be able to outthink the guy shooting them mm -hmm. and move at thinking speed. You know, don't move yourself so fast that you outrun your headlights and you overcommit and you do something you shouldn't do. You know, it's like, uh, you know, first don't lose. Yeah. You know, just have a good defense. Don't lose first. And then work your way through the problem and, and problem solve and, and be smart about it. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, and that, that crosses kind of, over. I mean, that, that crosses over like when you talk to people that are just looking at martial arts training. Because, I mean, that's its base is from a military basic training from thousands of years ago to defend themselves, the villages and people. Yeah. And, you know, it looks a little bit different now. But, the, you know, the principles are still the same. But what's interesting is like you mentioned something about fear, you know, that like people, they let that dictate a lot in their life. And I'd like for you to kind of expand on that a little bit about what you've noticed in the last, you know, 30 years of being around people, training people, both military, police, civilian, just, you know, you have tons of experience of dealing with a lot of different scenarios, some very high stress, some less stress. So why don't you explain that to us? Well, it's a deep subject, but... I think it's an important one. I, you know, fear, especially since I stepped out of the military, it's kind of given me um, a different perspective on life. You know, I went in when I was 17. I got out when I was 43. And so I was kind of institutionalized. It's like being in prison, but different. Uh, maybe a little more fun. Um, and so you, you, you just see the world differently. And so stepping out, I realized that one of the number one things that, that, uh, how fear controls people is they're afraid to follow that that passion in their life, that thing that they would do, they, or they would wake up every single day and go, man, I am so happy to wake up today and go to work because I get to do X. You know, I think it was Con Confucius, I think, said that, you know, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. It's kind of that. And if you think about really being able to master something and be the best in the world at it, you have to be passionate about it. And the only way to be passionate about it is to do something you love and don't have the fear to be able to pursue that. You know, you might have to get outside the matrix a little bit, take the path less traveled, and then be able to follow that. Um, Alan Watts, uh, he's a, a Taoist philosopher. He's got a great video on, uh, on YouTube, and it talks about just following, you know, your dream and doing that thing you love doing. And if you do, you'll end up being so amazing at it that you'll eventually find a way to make a living out of it. You know, it's yeah. like you love martial arts. You know, we've talked before. And so now you own dojos and you train police officers. You do this and you've made a living out of doing something you love doing. And the neat thing is when you do that, I think other people who love what they're doing, they're attracted to you because they see the love in what you do. And you, and then so you end up surrounding yourself with this incredible group of people. Um, and that's what I found in the special operations community. It was like everybody there loved what they did and tried to be the best at it. Therefore, you had all these people together who are absolutely the best at what they do. Well, that's why they can go out and do uncommon things because you've got 
super elite people, not units, but people, individuals out coming together, co-laboring to do something. Um, funny, stepping out of the military, the only other place I saw that was, uh, was in Hollywood. I, I got uh, worked on a movie and um, as the military advisor. And one thing I noticed was like every single person there was the best in the industry of what they did, whether it was the makeup, whether it was the set builders, the stunt people, the people who got you food, the directors, the lighting guy. I mean, everybody was like, you know, oh, that person has an Academy Award and this person is, and you're like, and then you go, well, no wonder movies are great because you've got all these people who are amazing at what they do, co-laboring to make something, make something awesome. So um, I think the other place where I see fear really influence people is both in politics and in religion. I think people kind of get boxed into this. If we just, you know, trust that somebody else is going to take care of me, then all my dreams will come true and, you know, everything will be good and bad stuff won't happen to me. That's not how the world works. You know, regardless of your spiritual bent, you know, I think we all know that there's love in, the, in this world and there's fear and there's evil in this world. And if you just stick your head in the sand, fear will still come find you and evil will still come find you and it will do bad things to you. So I think you have to, you know, be able to step out, be, be responsible for your own security at some level. And no matter where you're at in society, I think you need to be able to go after and pursue that. Um, which kind of takes me full circle. We talked just a little bit ago about, I, I mentioned the, the sheepdog principle, which I think is, a great analogy, you know, where you've got sheeple, you know, the people who just want to go around and, you know, stay in the matrix and just leave me alone. And that's good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody's not cut out to be um, the same type of person. And then you've got these sheepdogs, which usually the analogy is drawn to police or military where these people are out there and they're, they're circling, you know, kind of the sheeple and protecting them from the wolves. But what I think is missing in the whole analogy is the wolf hunter. You know, it's like, because the sheepdog is a defensive player. And if you're on the defense, it can, it makes you hyper vigilant all the time. And then it puts you in a sense of hopelessness. Like for instance, most of the soldiers who end up with PTS from being overseas are people who are on the defensive or they were out there just randomly going around waiting to get blown up, waiting to get sniped, waiting to get, you know, whatever, something bad was going to happen to them. Whereas in our community, we didn't do that. We were always on the offense going out after the wolves to hunt them down. And so I realize that isn't everybody's bent and lean in life, but interestingly, the, the Muslims have a, um, there's a verse in the Quran that says, um, saving one life is like saving all of humanity. And it's also in the Jewish Talmud, the ex almost the exact same verse, it's in there. And at first I thought that that was kind of a weird like saying, I was like, eh, what does that mean? But then I thought about it and I thought, you know, if you're that one person that's getting saved, it is all of your life, it is all of your humanity. And I think every single person out there on the planet can go out and save one life. And I don't mean save like in a churchy kind of sense, I mean like practical reality, the single mom down the street that doesn't have enough money to make ends meet, the kid that's being abused, the elderly person, the person that's depressed that's thinking about suicide. Every single one of us can do one. And if we all just did one, I mean, it would have the exponential effect. But I think the, the fear of not having enough stuff, the fear of how is this gonna affect me, the fear of how is this gonna look, it prevents people from doing just that. And so I think, you can't let fear control you at any level. Um, you know, I had, uh, I had leukemia. You know, you and I had talked about this before. And one of the things, like, I was in combat, actually, and felt bad, came off a mission one night and went down to the combat support hospital and the docs drew blood on me. And they're like, uh, Sergeant Major, we're sorry to tell you this, but you have leukemia. And I was like, what? I was like, I was just kicking somebody's door in six hours ago, giving them the business. And now you're telling me, I, you know, it's like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, but one of the things I did was I tried to stay positive and I didn't go look up all the bad things that could happen to me because how you think and how you view the world and your positive attitude, 
I don't know if it's the placebo effect. I don't know if it's spiritual, what it is, or if this is just how we're made, whether you believe in a creator or not, immaterial. I know that how you think and how you believe changes who you are. And there's tons of books on that. Uh, there's a book called The Placebo Effect that I read. Absolutely amazing. And it talks about how people's beliefs actually change their DNA. And I thought, man, th there's really, really, really something to this about, you know, don't let fear will always lead you down that path of not having a sound mind and not being able to think clearly. And you got to stay on the side of, of right, the side of being good and, you know, prevail and persevere in that environment. So I think you just have to, you just have to get out there. You only get one shot at this life, you know, and at the end of it all, you don't want to look back and go, oh man, I wish I would have done X and then realize it was because of fear that you didn't do that thing that, you know, you really wanted to do. So whenever you look at people that have that struggle of fear that kind of controls them, what are some things that you advise people on or tools you've given them to help break out of that fear, you know, where they can take control of their own destiny again? I think one of the primary things you can do is have a plan. You know, in our survival acronym, uh, one of them is vanquish fear. And the way to vanquish fear is start planning. You know, have contingency plans, start planning, because now your brain is thinking about the solution. It's not thinking about the problem. And I think if you don't have a plan and you're just focused on the problem, it just, it'll just keep piling on you, piling on you. You've got to come up with a plan and then start analyzing all of your plans, refining your plans, having contingency plans, and figure out a way to work your way out of the problem. The other thing I would tell you to do is surround yourself with good people who are positive. You know, don't sur surround yourself by a bunch of naysayers. Um, you can normally tell what type of person somebody is by the people they hang around. You know, because like we were talking about before, when you get around those people who are all the best at what they do, who are all A players in what they do, the other A players of the planet are gonna gravitate towards them. And now you're surrounded by A players and those A players are smart people too, who are positive and they're gonna help you. So it's not just an individual event. So it really, I mean, you really, it's a holistic approach. It's not just individual, it's community, it's people, it's family, but it's having a plan to work through those things. Just. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's almost kind of how you become the A player is everybody has to start somewhere. Not everybody right. gets born into being the best of the best of everything. And no. so when you have the plan and then you model excellence and you surround yourself with the influences of people that are doing exactly what you want to do, or at least playing on the level you want to play, then you start learning some of the shortcuts. And then even like you said, like what you focus on, it's almost like your focus will dictate your future because if you go looking for problems, you will find them. But you if you go looking them. for solutions, you will also find those as well. So, I, you know, I'm hearing a lot of parallels because it's like you take the martial arts methodology of training techniques and teaching people how to be black belts and to be good at, you know, hand to hand. You look at military training of teaching people how to be soldiers and how to be good at whatever task they're supposed to be tasked with. And then like your own journey where you went through that process so far that you became the trainer. And, and I think what I, I look back at our conversation is one of the best things that you said was whenever you break out of the box, everybody says they think out of the box, but when you break out of the box and you completely change the approach, when you look at times you've done that in your life where you were like, I'm going to break out of the box, I'm going to not follow what we've always done, and I'm going to find a better way, where has that led you? Well, it's led me, number one, to a lot of self-discovery. You know, because sometimes you have to like, before you do that, you really need to evaluate, you know, why are you doing things? Evaluate your motives. Um, but I think if you look at all the pioneers, you know, in the world, you look at Elon Musk. You know, here's a guy who's just out of the box and you're like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Or you look at like um, uh, the Gracies in their first UFC fight, you're like, how is like, you know, you remember Hoist Gracie and Dan Severinsen, you know, in their first fight, you're like, how is this guy that weighs twice as big as this guy? And it was just like one of those like light bulb moments I think a lot of people had. You went, wow, things do matter. These, these guys saw fighting differently. 
whenever it's out of the box thinking, it's just it just redefines your reality almost. Like you know, when the first UFC happened, that that changed the reality of hand to hand combat, and everybody was able to visually see that. And that's and that's one of those examples that is kind of noticeable, just because you know mainstream people have seen it, and they've seen the evolution of mixed martial arts because it's a sport. But like even within military operations, I'm sure over the years there has been tools or tactics that have changed or come along that was just changed the everything that you viewed a certain situation from and even off of the mat or out of the military operations in life in general there's things that happen in the world or to us personally that changes our whole viewpoint on the world itself just like when you hear people talk about becoming parents it changes their whole view of reality you Absolutely. know um, or when people have, you know, maybe a degree of trauma in their life, it changes their entire perspective on how they view things or their moral value compass or religious ex spiritual experience. You right. know, there's these paradigm shifts that we all kind of see. And sometimes I think it's collective, like, you know, watching a UFC was a collective paradigm shift versus the individual paradigm shift. Like when you had the leukemia and you found a way past it you have these individual and group, but they have the congruency of your perspective is changing. Therefore your reality has changed. Right. You know, I think, you know, the beautiful thing about changes is you can always change back. But, and if you change back, you're doing it more informed. And what I found sometimes is you might change something. You know, you started here and we changed it to here. And then they went, ah, oh, that's a little too much. And you dialed it back, but you're still better than where you started. And I think that's just kind of the, the ebb and flow of things. And, you know, again, I think it's all about um, thinking through the problem and just applying skills in a creative and new ways. Um, the, again, the way, we, the way we approached fighting in 03, 04, was a very, very different than what we did, you know, way at the end. And those principles still, um, still kind of apply no matter what. I mean, the principles of it are kind of the same. And, um, like when I went back out to our, our counterterrorism school, I tried to get, get the grading evaluation changed from being a very technique based, you know, your barrel will come up here and you're going to have to wave your barrel here or the secondary sector here. And it comes down like this and it's very, it's a sketch robotic to um, being is, is the, is the soldier demonstrating that he understands the principles of what's going on. Cause if the guy in front of him does something that's maybe not textbook, but the guy behind him picks up and goes, Oh, well, I just need to cover his back and do whatever. Well, then I understand that he understands the big picture and he understands the principles behind what's going on. So I think that's kind of it. You've got to, understand at a macro level, you know, in the military, we always had the commander's intent. We would do an operations order and you'd have an, you know, your execution paragraph would have step-by-step, step, you know, the scheme maneuver and th these are the details of everything's going to go. But before you did that, you always had the commander's intent. And why? Because chances are that plan is going to get shot down. It's not going to work out the way you intended and you're going to have to adjust on the fly. I remember we were uh, going in to get some really bad guys one night and we had one group and some civilian vehicles and we were on a helicopter coming in and w I was up in the helicopter watching the civilian vehicles and we were going to hit two different targets separated by a couple of kilometers and so we were going to wait till the civilian vehicles got close and we were going to drop down the deck and go hit our target and as we're watching we see one of the civilian vehicles with our guys in it it rolls over in a drainage ditch and it's like oh what do we do there you know like that's not something we actually like went oh so we're like hey is everybody okay yeah they're okay all right well blow that thing in place and it was a really impressive explosion tonight something hollywood would have been proud of and then we just continued the mission but it was just one of those times where it's like hey stuff happens but the yeah. intent was this is the operation this was needs to get done and you remain flexible and adaptable to the situation and just make it happen so i think that's a uh, you know, when you listen to high achievers talk, a lot of people discuss that is don't look at what the steps are. Don't get too focused on the checklist. The order of operations is not everything. What is the outcome that you want? You know, so you have that generic view of like, what is the, what is the generic overall outcome I need from this circumstance? Because I might have to change midstream. And when you listen to anybody that's performed on any type of 
you know, high level or a very realistic level, adaptation was part of their success because something happened. It went sideways, didn't go as planned. I didn't make the cut. I didn't win the medal. I didn't, you know, the operation went sideways. The vehicle flipped over, but staying focused on the outcome. And when you mentioned that people's comprehension of material matter is usually demonstrated by the level that they can adapt. I think that that's a really good metric that you can measure and that you can identify, right. but it doesn't chop it down into that mechanical step one, two, three, you did the dance and now you are successful. Because when you listen to the people, you hear that all the time. It's like, just stay focused on the outcome, which goes back to what you'd said about controlling your focus is, you know, you mm -hmm. stay focused on the outcome that you want, you adapt and you adjust for the hiccups that are going to occur because it's just, you know, like flying the plane. It's not going to be a straight shot. There's going to be several mini adjustments along the way, but you just stay focused on the end goal, which I think really resonates with an underlying um, thread that you've been discussing. And when you tie it into what you talked about with the fear, the fear is what changes people's focus away from the outcome that they seek. It causes the hyper focus on the wrong things. I, I hear it said, you know, they major in minor things. It's a good point. That's a good way to put that. I've never heard that. You know, yeah. I had, um, I went to a, um, an Intel collecting course. We'll, we'll call it that. And I had an instructor who had worked in the government at very high levels for a number of years. And we were having a, you know, a small group meeting. He was just explaining to us, you know, how to do different things. And he explained that their best people in the field, they had analyzed all like they took their, their best people in the field and tried to analyze what made them successful. So they went back and they looked at their education, their upbringing, religious background, you know, their socioeconomic status, all this thing. And they could never find a common thread in any of that. And he said that the only common thread they found is all the real successful players in the field were people who had the ability to deal with the intangibles and adapt and be flexible. I like that. And I think that that really applies to everything in life. You know, perseverance, you know, is probably one also. I think that's probably part of it. You know, you hit this roadblock and you're like, oh, well, I need to go around it this way, or I, you know, I need to go over, or this time I need to go under, or what? And you're adaptable and flexible to the situation, and you understand the end game and, and where you're trying to go. And um, yeah. there is no, you know, it's like my friend was telling me, there is no magic technique. You know, any, any technique you create, a scenario can be created to defeat it. So you just have to understand the game and be able to play it. Yeah. Well, you know, so when you were in the military, when you left for the medical issues and everything, um, there was a circumstance that came up in which you went back to Iraq, right? And technically weren't enlisted? Yeah, I did. I, I went back. Um, I was asked to go back with a friend of mine um, who was going to meet with um, one, of the, one of their head um, religious leaders over there. And he was kind of concerned about the security aspects of it. And I met him actually doing through a church security course. I, 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 when I retired, I went to Colorado and I'd met some guys there. Anyway, long story short, he's like, hey, would you mind going back with me? And it was funny because, I don't know, it was just a few months prior to that. I saw what was going on with ISIS when they went back in. And right where they went in was up in Mosul where I had served my last tour at. And... Man, I was just heartbroken. I mean, when you're seeing little kids being crucified and throat slit and just, I mean, there was barbaric, sadistic stuff going on, going down at a level that was, made the Nazis look nice. You know what I mean? It, it was like that level of, of bad guy stuff. And so this opportunity presented itself and I was like, man, I, I really need to go do that. So I went over there and just kind of helped set this meeting up and, you know, make sure everything was good with that. And then while I was over there, um, this guy, uh, he, he was a Muslim leader, but he says, Hey, you know, there's some Iraqi Christians here that are refugees and they're in this, they got bad stuff going on with them. Would you like to meet some of them? I was like, well, yeah, I would. And so when I met him, dude, I just wept. It was just like, it was, it was just like, I knew it was like, this is why I'm here. I'm supposed to do something for these people. So I called home and talked to my wife. I said, Hey, this is what, you know, where I'm at. And you know, this is what I'm seeing. And she's like, oh, well, I guess you know why you're there now. You know, do what you do, then come home. And, um, you know, so it was interesting to train my whole career to do 
hostage rescue stuff. And then I step out of the military and now I'm over there and it's a hostage rescue, but of a different nature, of a different type. You know, you're saving, you know, we were able to, you know, get some of these families out of harm's way and then um, uh, get them signed up with the UN and, and move to another country and get them set up in apartments and help them start a new life, et cetera. You know, and it was rewarding, but you know, the, the principles of what we did was actually the same. You know, I feel like that story kind of brings out is because you're in the military, career man, you're out of it, you're on to the next part of your life, but yet you go back and you, you know, are rescuing refugees under the guise of being basically a, a private citizen contractor, whatever you want to call it, because your moral compass did not change where what you are supposed to do yeah. of helping people and serving people it, you know, it's not dicta It's not dictated by job. It's dictated by duty that kind of is ingrained in you as a human being. And that's and that's why I wanted to bring that up because you know you basically volunteer to go across the world to the worst part that there is to do good things. And the only reason for doing so is because it's the right thing. Which goes back to what you were talking about earlier. If we had more people that were just doing the right thing that weren't obsessed and concerned about their fear and they help the people in the community and they help the people that need some assistance, the world is going to be a better place. And, and you're truly a, a testament to that with what you've done with your career, not only in the military, but post-military um, of not just that incident, but whenever now, you know, you travel training military groups and law enforcement groups and you do professional speaking, you know, you have a book that's in process, you know, you're trying to spread this message of do the right thing, get the skills to be successful and then take those skills and help others be successful. So I just, uh, I just really appreciate the time, um, you know, just knowing each other and being friends and hanging out, doing cool stuff has been extremely rewarding. And I always love to hear the stories, obviously, but you've been a great coach and a mentor, not only to me, but to a lot of people that you're around because you just, you influence them with success of how to overcome the obstacle, regardless of the circumstance. Is there anything you'd like to finish with today? You no, know, I would just tell people to don't let fear rule you, you know, get out there and get after it. Save one life. You know, if we all just set that goal, just find that one person that you can, steer their ship two or three degrees here right now because that two or three degrees years down the road is going to take them a long way from where on, on the track that they're headed right now so get out there and be amazing the world needs you and uh we all count so thank you again caleb i appreciate all your help and um i appreciate you trying to get the the word out there in the martial arts community and in the law enforcement community and just uh inspire people to uh to rise up and do great things yeah, you know, and then lastly, of course, you know, you have the redeployed organization, in which is kind of your outlet of how you achieve these things. Um, and you're also partnered up with SSGT that does primarily the law enforcement training. And of course, you know, your work with the Moss Creek Ranch, where you take people out on hunts and show them how to use right. long guns. But also, you get to do some cool military stuff out there sometimes, too. So if anybody's looking to contact you or reach you, um, I'll post some links and stuff in the show notes so they'll be able to reach out. Appreciate all the time today, and I hope you have a good day, man. All right, you too. Thanks a lot. Godspeed.